The literature implicates that when testosterone levels become super physiologic, that's when you can potentially increase your risk of vascular damage and have a heart attack or a stroke. But no data to date says that when males keep their testosterone levels greater than 500 and less than 1,000, the goal being if you're an older gentleman, 600, 700, if you're a younger guy, 800, 900, you will not increase your cardiovascular risk from the hormones per se. Hey, welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. I feel truly blessed for yet another incredible podcast coming at you. Dr. Doreen Saltiel joins me today. Doreen has been practicing medicine for almost 40 years, and she studies three particular areas which are literally of this perfect overlap for exactly what I'm most interested in right now. And the reason I'm most interested in it is because I think most men are suffering with these three areas. Three areas are cardiovascular function, hormones, and peptides. Those are probably occupying 80 to 90% of my learning right now as I try to expand my awareness, expand my knowledge, and ultimately understand how I can deliver a better result for you. So Dr. Doreen Saltiel joins me today to talk about hormones, uh, male hormones specifically, how we can optimize for testosterone, for DHEA, for other ones as well, estrogen. Um, we also talk about cardiovascular function. She is a board-certified anti-aging and regenerative medicine expert and with a fellowship in the American Co College of Cardiology, as well as anti-aging and metabolic and functional medicine. She is definitely no underachiever. She's got advanced training in endocrinology, as well as metabolic function, anti-aging, and nutritional medicine. Dr. Saltiel is literally a leading expert on male and female hormone health. So guys, if you want to optimize your body, you want to sit down, take out a pen, or at least give us your full attention on this one. This one's going to be a deep dive into some things that are very, very important, and also some really complex things that Doreen does an incredible job of simplifying, including something as, uh, as complex as cholesterol. We dive into the big ones as far as cardiovascular function, ultimately what we should be doing and how to, how to optimize for cardiovascular function. If anything's going to take you out in your life, chances are it's going to be cardiovascular health, right? For, it seems to be uh, leaps and bounds above everything else. So Dr. Doreen is a cardiologist who ultimately has a very, very good and complete knowledge when it comes to uh, optimizing for cardiovascular function. As I said, we also talk about hormones and where hormone replacement therapy should be applied, where peptide therapy should be applied, and ultimately uh, whether or not you should be using them. Are they useful? We talk about the HPA axis, which is ultimately the balance of hormones, stress hormones like cortisol, adrenaline. Um, and is there supplemental intervention that we could ultimately be leveraging to um, you know, allow us to, to live a healthier life? We talk about the links between hormone replacement therapy, insulin resistance, and the key interventions. So if you're someone who tends to be uh, overweight or have a hard time losing body fat, that's something you want to think about. We talk about all the things, heart health, cholesterol, saturated fat, genetics, statins, and who they for, are for and who they're not for. So again, as I said, an amazing conversation with Dr. Doreen Saltiel. I love that I have her as a resource, that the world has her as a resource to be able to answer some of our most complex questions. Because guys, as I say, if you're not paying attention to your cardiovascular health, start. It's so important. This is one of the, probably my top priority right now in my life after that's being someone who ultimately burned the candle at both ends for many, many years as a professional bodybuilder. I'm doing everything I can to reverse any and all damage that I inflicted to myself first as a garbage eating child and now into my 20s and 30s as a bodybuilder who is obviously abusing hormones. Uh, I know I've done some damage and so I'm doing everything I can to understand how I can reverse it so I can ultimately teach you and I can teach myself. So today's podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Organifi. If you haven't already picked up Organifi greens and reds, go ahead and do so now. Organifi.com slash muscle use the code MUSCLE for 20% off. Now, the greens and the reds are essential. I think everyone should be taking these greens. Everyone should be taking these reds. Guys, especially if you're interested in cardiovascular function or, or erectile function, we want to make sure that we're getting enough reds in our body to really supercharge our cardiovascular system and our nitric oxide system. Reds is going to recharge your body and mind with this great blend of superfood berries and uh, ultimately adaptogens, antioxidants, and, and things like uh, mushrooms. So increase your energy. Uh, increase your uh, pumps in the gym, and ultimately make sure you take care of your system. 
Uh, ladies and gents, one more time, that's Organifi.com slash muscle. Head over there after our show with the amazing, the incredible Dr. Doreen Saltiel. I think I manifested bringing you into my life because like this is literally everything. You're, you're talking my language now. This is literally exactly what I'm looking into. And I've kind of made a commitment over the next 12 to 24 months to really start to uh, you know, at least understand it to the level that I'm not, I certainly wouldn't understand it to the level that I need to, but certainly to the level where I, I can guide people in the right direction. Like, you know, I need to understand at the depth to go, okay, this is the person you need to look to, or this is the, this is where we should look. Like, I don't ever expect to understand to the level of someone like yourself, but being able to kind of understand it, at, you know, I always say like a deep, generous level, right? I'm so excited that you're here. Hopefully you have the next five hours of your life available for me to ask questions. <laughs> I always, for you, Ben, for right, you, you, anything. Thank you. So I would love to, gosh, all of it, right? So when you say hormones, uh, as far as its its effect on um, the cardiovascular system, you know, I, I hate doing this because it, it's something that I kind of do by necessity, but I talk to men, right? And I talk to men because it's impossible, as you know, to, to serve everyone and service everyone. And so for me, like I want to optimize for myself and I'll optimize for my community of men. And I don't mean to ever leave women out because I, I probably have 30 to 40% listeners that are women. And they always get angry with me. Like, why are you, why are you only talking about men? Because like, it's really hard. Because I think, and you could tell me if, I, if I'm wrong on this, but I think female hormones are so much more complicated. I'm like, I don't even want to try. Like if, if I get females, I can't even like, I, I could give you 1% off the top, but there's so much that I don't even try. Like I'm like, go, go to this person. <laughs> So I would love to, uh, if you wouldn't mind, under the under the the framing of like optimization of male hormones for cardiovascular function, I'd love to just like kind of let you, you know, wind it up, let you go because it sounds like it, it's a passion of yours, and and maybe take us down the path of the hormones that have the greatest implication and, and effect. Yeah, as you know, my training is in cardiovascular disease. That was my background, and when I trained, I never thought about hormones and the impact hormones have. And as I got into the hormone world, I started to realize the importance of balanced sex hormones and balanced cortisol and balanced thyroid. And so if we just start with testosterone, because testosterone is the main male hormone, estradiol is important. And we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes, but really balance testosterone levels, not too high, not too low, because the literature implicates that when testosterone levels become super physiologic, that's when you can potentially increase your risk of vascular damage and have a heart attack or a stroke. But no data to date says that when males keep their testosterone levels greater than 500 and less than 1,000, the goal being if you're an older gentleman, 600, 700. If you're a younger guy, 800, 900, you will not increase your cardiovascular risk from the hormones per se. Now, you may have other risk factors that increase your cardiovascular risk, but the hormones will not. And then when you add cortisol into the equation, which, as you know, is key, especially when you're talking about athletes and whether it be lifters, it doesn't matter what the who the athlete is, they tend to burn the candle at both ends. And cortisol has an inverse relationship with testosterone. So if cortisol levels are high and the body senses you're running away from a white tiger all the time, the body says, I'm not interested in procreating. So testosterone, that whole what's called hypothalamic pituitary gonadal access is shut off because you're running away from a white tiger. And then if you and when you go to a lot of traditional docs, they don't even think about cortisol. They just see low testosterone. And then they decide, should I give you testosterone or not? And in a young guy, a guy who's 40, 35, 40, I would not use testosterone as my mm. first choice. I would use things like peptides, kispeptin, gonadotropin. Kispeptin basically signals the hypothalamus to release gonadotropin releasing hormone, which signals FSH and LH, which causes testosterone to be released. Gonadotropin is gonadotropin-releasing hormone. It triggers, the, it works one step lower. 
And it works similarly to HCG. The problem is you can't get HCG anymore, quote unquote, legally, Mm -hmm. you know, from a compounding pharmacist because it's more than 40 amino acids and it's considered a biologic. You can still get it from a commercial pharmacy, but the cost is astronomical. And really the indications are infertility in a guy. And you can use Clomid. Yeah, you're you're the first person that's come on this podcast and talked about those two peptides, kispeptin for sure. And I've been aware of it for a while. And you know, as for and I'll be always be transparent for myself as a as a professional bodybuilder for, you know, using steroids for you know consistently almost eighteen years. I'd say I would love to be able to you know optimize my hormones naturally. I don't think it'd ever be possible. I still do take my one fifty to two hundred milligrams a week, but I would love to kind of talk to the the efficacy you've experienced with kispeptin and like. Actually, having people because I'm young, I'm, I mean, I'm 41, so I'd like to optimize. That'd be ideal for me. But what would it look like, and what what dosages, and, and have you seen some pretty good results from people taking kispeptin? And um, I forget what the other peptide was. Gonadarone. Gonadarone. Yeah, it, kispeptin it works really well in people who don't have elevated prolactin levels and who don't have really uh, disruptive cortisol because that's going to turn that signaling peptide off. So giving that signaling peptide is not going to be helpful. Gonadarellin works a step lower. You'll probably get more success with that. And it's similar to HCG. You start with once a week, you go to twice a week. And the, but it has a bell shaped curve so that if you think more is better, what winds up happening is testosterone falls when you tip over that bell shaped curve. And if LH is maximally elevated because the body is working so hard, the neither one of those peptides are going to work, right? Because, because LH is already maximally stimulated. Right. So in those individuals, testosterone is probably the best option. And when I treat guys, I tell them to divide their testosterone. You know, don't do it all at one time. Two reasons. One, the high of testosterone, but more importantly, the elevated estradiol. Mm -hmm. Because estrogens can never negatively, you need estra, men need estradiol. And the range should be 20 to 40 picograms per mil using a special assay because you're at the lower end of the reference range. When it starts to go up above 50 and serum hormone binding globulin starts to go up, not only does it negatively impact sexual function, but it also negatively impacts serum hormone binding globulin bone mineral density. So for someone who's at an elevated estrogen, are you an advocate of, you know, aromatase inhibitors or do yes. you have another? Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I, I'm sure you've heard the, or maybe not, but the, the, uh, I've heard potentially people saying there's some, some, and you would be the great person to answer this, some micro blistering, some vascular challenges from the administration of, of aromatase inhibitors. Are you familiar with that research? Yes. And the answer is yes, it can do that. But more importantly, it can, if you lower estradiol too much, it will increase osteopenia and osteoporosis. Right. So at a low dose, it's it's probably reasonable to to yeah. experiment yeah. with some uh, aromatase inhibitors. Okay. And is is an astrozole the one to go with? I know some people were playing with the aromatex. No, sorry. Letra, no, letrozole, letrozole or um, what's the other one? There's the suicidal suicide inhibitor aromatex, and I'll, I'll remember it. I forget. Okay. There's there's yeah there's um, aromatex and aromacin. No, I don't use that one. I typically use either uh, an astrazole or letrozole. And in my guys, I tend to use an astrazole because it's shorter acting. And if something happens, I can always stop it. And I typically start it once a week, see how they do. And we just go from there. Like one milligram once a week? Yeah, I start with, depending on what their estradiol level is. If their estradiol is 50, I may start with a half a milligram because I'm just trying to get it to that 35, uh, 30 to 35. If it's 80, then I say two things. Your testosterone is too high because the only way a guy gets estradiol that's that high is from testosterone. Yeah. So lower the dose and split the dose. And then I'd start them on a milligram and then I'd give them natural aromatase inhibitors also. Like what? Like, 
you know, you give people DIM and you give people uh, indole 3 carbonyl, you can right. give them resveratrol. But really, the truth is natural products sort of work. But when estradiol levels are that high, you need a drug. Yeah, I've seen miraculous. I'm, I'm curious if you have as well. I've seen miraculous shifts in, in estradiol, which is changing body fat levels. Like getting someone under 50% body fat, in, in my experience working with clients, just is like enormous relative to being, you know, 20, 25. It's, it's like, okay, but you drop someone down to like a, what we'll call, you know, a quote unquote lean body. It's, it's so, such a difference maker. Yeah, because fat store, fat has a lot of aromatase activity because yeah. inflammation increases aromatase activity. And so when you have all that, whether it be belly fat or wherever you're holding your fat, whether it be, you know, handles, you're going to convert testosterone to estradiol much more readily than if you were lean. Yeah. So one thing that I'd like to, to talk about in the podcast, just for so people can hear it, is, again, I'll tell you kind of true or false question, lower testosterone is worse for health than high testosterone. So I've heard some people suggests that, you know, if your testosterone is too low, because I know there's a lot of guys out there who are on the fence, like, I don't want to do testosterone replacement therapy because I have to do it for my whole life. Their, TR, their testosterone is low and they, they have this in their mind of like, high testosterone is bad, so I don't want to take this hormone therapy. So you've just said that being in a healthy range is not bad, but I'm curious if being too low versus being too high has, has different health implications. Yeah, being too low definitely does because the literature tells us that when testosterone is low, you increase insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, you increase cardiovascular risk. So we're back to that and you increase the risk of, of osteopenia and osteoporosis. And low testosterone is implicated in cognitive impairment. The unfortunate thing is similar to women. Estradiol is implicated in cognitive impairment, but there's not strong data that says if I give a guy back testosterone, I'm going to improve his cognition. So the goal is to prevent it. Right. And so when we talk about too high, if we're talking about 1100 and 1200, no big deal. If we're talking about 2000, then the conversion to estradiol not only increases the risk of increased serum hormone binding globulin, but then you increase the venous thromboembolic risk, right? The clotting risk. Because it's yeah. estradiol that causes clotting. It's not the testosterone. So there's this nice bell curve. That's why they say try to stay greater than 500, less than 1,000, uh, because we know that those are the safest. Do you, do you just always abide by the reference range, Doreen? Or do you, because like I've heard some some data that, you know, in the early 80s, the range was, you know, 1,200 to 1,500. So I'm curious if you've seen that or any considerations around what they've believed to be our kind of median in the, in the past. I take each patient individually. I have some guys who do best at 1,300, 1,400. I have some guys who do great at 800. Based on just subjective subjective feedback? Lean muscle where their other hormone levels are, how they're sleeping, how they're feeling. Yes. Okay. That's great. So just to summarize, if, if we were to choose the best course of action for someone, let's say, I don't know, I guess age is, age is a consideration. Would you prefer a kiss peptin gonadarellin or would you prefer HCG if it was available to people who didn't want to go the TRT route? If, HR, if uh, HCG was available, that would be my first choice. Okay. Because the data is so clear. Mm. If they can't, then I would do kispeptin or gonadarellin or clomid. And remember, if cost is an issue, clomid is cheap. HCG is expensive. Yeah. Is the most expensive now. And so peptides fall in the middle. And, you know, outside of a compounding pharmacy who can't make it anymore because it's not legal, you're paying 1500 bucks a month. Well, yeah, that's crazy. You know, yeah, where you'll pay 300, 400 bucks a month for peptides and you'll pay what, 30 bucks a month for Clomid. So right. cost plays into this, of course. Of course. Now, is this an ongoing thing with HCG Doreen? Is it something yeah. like you should do once a week or what's your standard protocol typically? I typically do twice a week for HCG. Start at 500 international units and then I go to 1,000 international units unless I'm dealing with fertility. If we're talking about fertility, then I'm doing 1,500 twice a week. For just a short amount of time until you get the job done. Yeah. And for guys who need to go on testosterone for like 
uh, people who've taken anabolic steroids or for whatever other reason, I tell them to freeze their sperm before we're going to do this. So that, because once you give somebody exogenous outside, you know, testosterone, you're going to shut down their entire systems. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. And I'll share this. I don't know if I shared it publicly before. Like I, I was a competitive body for a long time and I was on the biggest mm-hmm. cycles of my life when I had both my children. So, so I don't know how much, how much that data holds up for everybody. It's uh, maybe I'm an anomaly. I mean, yeah. it, you know, but you know, what does data do? Data collects from a population of individuals Yeah. and then they publish the data, just like guidelines or guidelines. You know, you look at the guidelines, you say, okay, and then you deal with the patient. And you meet the patient where they are and you figure out what they want, what they need. And what I tell everybody, start low, go slow. You'll reach your goal. Be consistent. Yeah. Um, that's an awesome summary of testosterone, certainly of its effects on, on optimization of life and then certainly its, its implication on cardiovascular health. I'd love to shift to thyroid. And so obviously it has an enormous implication on body composition, on quality of life. And I'm curious if there's any kind of direct correlation there with cardiovascular health, I'd like to kind of tie everything back to that cardiovascular thing. Cause I know that is your, your area of expertise. Well, certainly hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, they're both implicated in cardiovascular disease, but more importantly, the thyroid is the metabolic engine, as you know, and it responds to what the HPA access, what cortisol is doing, because it requires energy to put to produce thyroid hormone. So if cortisol is requiring, depending on where somebody is on that cortisol spectrum, that HPA axis spectrum, will determine how the thyroid responds. So if you've ever seen people or people look at their labs and they see a low, you know, a borderline low TSH, 0.8, 0.9, they see a T4 of 0.9 or 1, and they see a T3 of 2.5, 2.6, that's their HPA access. Mm. That is not primarily a thyroid issue. That is an HPA access issue because the thyroid shuts itself down, down regulates. So the brain and the body can run away from a white tiger. And as you move along that spectrum, the thyroid will stay shut down until you correct the underlying HPA access abnormality. And there is a ton of literature on the HPA access and cardiovascular disease, a ton of literature. A flattened cortisol curve increases your risk, increased nighttime cortisol increases your risk, low morning cortisol increases your risk. And so at the same time, if you tie that to the thyroid, People who see those kinds of thyroid patterns are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And then if people have antibodies, thyroid antibodies, that's a poor man's test for leaky blood vessels. And so we're going to tie it back to the cardiovascular system. If you have leaky blood vessels, you have leaky blood vessels in the heart. It sets the heart off up for that inflammatory vascular uh, disease that drives cardiovascular outcomes. That's great to know. And I know, at least I believe I've heard you speak about gluten and dairy as being kind of really, really uh, influential on, you call it leaky gut, call it leaky vascular system. Yeah, partially because the immune system lives in the gut. 70 to 80% of your immune system lives there. And if you live in Italy, or in the Mediterranean, you told me you were eating pasta. I'd say, eat some for me. Go nuts. But yeah. unfortunately, in the United States, they add so much gluten for processing and dairy. Who knows what's in dairy these days? You know, between the pesticides they spray on the grass and the same thing with wheat. And, you know, and then you have hormones given to cows. So they're nice and fat for marbled steaks. It just, you know, drives uh, gut health. Yeah. Uh, I've had Tatis Karazi on the podcast and he just did like the, an amazing masterclass on gluten and dairy and gut health. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Karazi, but he's, he's probably number one guy. Yeah. He's just brilliant. I mean, he's, he's just a, just a brilliant um, wealth of information. So then let, let's shift gear. Inflammation that comes along with it because that's his thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's actually how I found him. I was, you know, as a bodybuilder, I was healthy, but I wasn't super aware of some of the things that are implicated in optimization of the nervous system. And he was the first guy I came across when it came to neural inflammation. I wanted to understand it. And and, and uh, he was just like such an amazing resource. I've studied him for many years. Um, so shifting gears then, I guess, or, or staying on alignment, but shifting gears, gears slightly to the HPA axis and optimization of cortisol rhythms. To me, it, it's a very um, seemingly poorly communicated system. Like everyone knows the, the relevance of the HPA. Everyone knows the relevance of cortisol rhythms, but nobody really says, Hey, this is what to do about it. Like we probably know that, you know, it needs to be high in the morning. We know it needs to be kind of decreasing at night and maybe, maybe antagonistic with um, melatonin. But, you know, is it just the day to day light exposure and the sleep and the, you know, the, the typical lifestyle practices you suggest? Or are there other interventions like peptides, like, uh, I don't know, hormonal interventions, supplemental interventions that actually work? Yeah, actually, it's very interesting. There's something called the cortisol awakening response. I don't know if you've read about that. That's yep. the sense of awakening. And then 30 minutes later, when you're awake, that really speaks to HPA access resilience. How yep. much in that preparatory time frame, the, anticipata- the anticipation of the day's events, can you generate cortisol, mm-hmm. right? And then the diurnal curve that you see during the day is really a day-to-day thing. So if you want to talk about looking at what I'm like three months ago, you need hair cortisol or four, three months. But you can get a pretty good idea of how somebody lives if they do it on a typical day. And really what you, as you said, you want to see you're high and then you start to come down and you relax uh, at night. So, you know, if somebody has a dysregulated HPA access, in addition to lifestyle, which is sleep, diet, you know, sunlight at the appropriate time, not going to bed with your phone and staring at whatever, you know, all the, those things, um, how you deal with your day, how you perceive the day. Bruce McEwen has written a lot about this. Um, he's probably one of the world's experts on the HPA axis. Um, and it's really how you view an event. You and I see the same event based on your upbringing, based on how you deal with life versus how I see things and how I deal with life. We've seen the same, same event. Will our curves may be totally different. So it's really a lifetime of experiences and perceptions that play into the HPA axis. And then what do you do? Well, if your curve is high and your DHEA is high, because remember the same signaling causes the release of DHEAS, which is totally an adrenal hormone, then that's much easier to deal with. It's adaptogens, it could be meditation, it could be you know, just walking outside in the sunshine, everybody has their thing that helps them relax. And I also encourage people to do something called heart math, which basically synchronizes the heart and the brain. Mm -hmm. It's much harder when the curve is low and flat because that person has already gone through the stages of adaptation and they're approaching burnout. Then we're looking at more intense lifestyle things, and it may be changing jobs. Uh, it may be not exercising uh, for three months, six months, and really beginning to build resilience. And there are adaptogens that are available that will help raise cortisol in people who have low cortisol. What are your favorites? It de- for low cortisol, you know, I typically do, well, for high cortisol, it's easy. You do things like Rolora. Uh, you do things if somebody is one of those individuals who their brain never stops working, you do something with theanine in it. You can do, make sure you have a little bit of B6 in it because B6 modulates cortisol. And then for low cortisol, you want to do something short term that has licorice in it because you don't want the conversion of cortisol to cortisone to happen. 
And that's by an enzyme 11 beta HSD2, which is what cortisol, which is what licorice inhibits. And then mm. you may want to give them glandulars. Glandulars support the adrenal gland and support the brain. And you may want to give them neuro, you know, something like neuromedulla which balances heart rate. It also helps with that, oh my God, oh my God, cortisol feeling. So there are a number of different tricks. And the most important thing is getting them to sleep, you know, because even though they're tired, they may not be able to sleep well. And I'm a big melatonin believer. There is no feedback for everybody who thinks if you give somebody too much melatonin, it's going to shut off melatonin. The literature tells us no, no, no. It's not like other hormones. And I would say get it from a good company because not all melatonin is the same. That's good to know. Do you, do you have a specific company you suggest? I typically use something. I mean, I'm, Emerson is a third part, full script. Emerson is a third party. Yep. And I usually use drops of uh, melatonin either from pure encapsulations or ortho. I mean, the Metagenics, there are a lot of good brands out there. Or I compound it. I'll compound it for somebody in a trochee, a 10 milligram trochee, and I, they, you can cut them in full, you know, quarters. And I typically start with a half so that you're absorbing it immediately as opposed to swallowing it and having to have it work through the gut. That's why drops are always better because again, you absorb it directly. Someone has to have a healthy gut to get the benefits from melatonin. That's fantastic advice. I've never heard anybody say that before, and that makes so much sense. And and there's a lot of I know there's there's people on both sides of the melatonin camp for sure. You hear people who are just adamant that you're shutting down your your own production and it's hormones, so you shouldn't do it. And I'm glad you have that that insight and feedback. And because there's definitely some confusion around that. For let's just say for hormonally driven cancers, they give. Let me give you an example: women with breast cancer. They get 50 milligrams. I know. Yeah. I mean, so there is data out there on this and there's data out there that it doesn't, you know, turn off. There's the pineal gland doesn't have that same feedback as all the other systems do. Um, here's a kind of a tangent question. You brought up the pineal, um, the, you brought up the pineal gland. And I think there's been some, you know, uh, rumblings, we'll say, around calcification of the pineal gland with certain lifestyle interventions, certain you know, maybe it's fluoride uh, consumption. Do you have any opinions or or um, thoughts around the likelihood that even is even a thing? And is there something that people should be doing to, uh, you know, optimize? Because I work with a lot of guys who are, you know, 40, 50 plus, some guys in their 60s and 70s, and a lot of them simply don't have great deep sleep, right? And, and so we are looking for these interventions to optimize for deep sleep, REM sleep. And uh, so one thing I've always considered was, you know, the peptide penelion or you know, the, the avoidance of fluoride. I'm curious if you've seen any experience, you know, clinically or anecdotally for the use or any intervention to optimize for uh, natural melatonin secretion. You know, interestingly, um, there are things, you know, increasing tryptophan will increase uh, melatonin, but I have not seen a lot of literature on using supplemental melatonin and shutting off the systems. And I heard a lecture actually last weekend where the guy just got up on the stage and said, that's hogwash and showed a bunch of studies. And I haven't had time to, to look at them. I heard about fluoride and calcification, but I don't have enough experience with fluoride and uh, pineal gland calcification to say something even intelligent other than, okay, I've heard about it. Right. I'll, I'll look into it. So you mentioned the use of licorice to prevent cortisol converting into cortisone. What negative impact is is that having in the body? So is cortisone, if you, I don't even want to speculate, if you could walk us through, like, if, if I'm converting too much cortisol into cortisone, what will I experience from that? Cortisone is the inactive form of cortisol. Hmm. So when you look at the two curves, you got to look at them together because the, the body shifts to cortisone two circumstances. Number one, the brain is saying, you don't need all that cortisol, slow down. And so it shifts it or in the setting of obesity, because you sequester a lot of cortisol, you get a lot of cortisone, you have lots of, you know, cortisol metabolites, 
because you're sequestering a lot of cortisol. And so people with low cortisol are going to feel fatigue, right? Makes sense. Yeah. Because cortisone is inactive. Right. So you got to look at both curves together. And remember, the salivary gland has a lot of that converting hormone, 11 beta HSD2. And what they say is that if you're getting a salivary test, you should look at cortisone as a reflection of serum. So that's why you have to look at the two together. But certainly you have to look at the patient's symptoms, because if it doesn't fit the clinical picture, then you scratch your head and said, OK, uh, talk to me some more. Right. But typically yeah. low cortisol, people feel fatigued. Speaking of the salivary test, you brought that up and it made me think of something you said recently or that I heard you say recently was you, you tend to use Dutch test a lot as far as a salivary test and, and testosterone tends to score or show high on, on a, on a Dutch test. Is that true? On any salivary test. Yeah. That was interesting because I think a lot of people are using a Dutch test as their kind of primary, uh, look at the testosterone levels or, or certainly cortisol as well. Typically, Mark Newman, who's the president, he didn't develop a salivary hormone test other than cortisol because saliva for cortisol is the gold standard. And the reason I use the Dutch test is because it's validated. So, you know, talking a little bit about testing, there's lots of labs out there. Some of them are very good. Some of them are very good, but never validated their tests. Right. And so how do you know what to do with the information? I know that when I look at a Dutch test and I look at estrogen metabolism, that's been validated. When I look at, in a woman, you know, estrogen, uh, estradiol on the test, I know the serum equivalent because all the studies were done in serum. There are no saliva equi equivalents. And for men, testosterone is the gold standard. What Dutch does is it adds estrogen metabolism and a look at how you're metabolizing testosterone because it's really estrogens that increase the risk of prostate cancer. It's not testosterone. It's not DHT. It's basically aberrant or abnormal aromatase activity that increases prostate cancer risk. Mm. And so the Dutch test will help you look at how people are meta males are metabolizing their estrogens down the preferred pathway or down the pathway that's known to cause a lot of DNA damage. And are they adequately methylating their estrogens to neutralize them so they don't become toxic intermediaries? So that's the beauty of the Dutch test in males as well as females. That's beautiful insight. Thank you for that. One thing that comes to mind as far as staying on this path of hormone optimization is, is insulin, which I'm sure is a, is a hot topic amongst many people. And, and, you know, passing through the lens of longevity and passing through the lens of cardiovascular health, are you just an advocate of ultimately just keeping insulin as low as possible? Cause you know, what, I, what I toggle between is longevity and performance, right? So a lot of my athletes are saying, Hey, man, I got to perform. And I want to live long. And obviously I pushed insulin pathways for a long time. And so I'm curious if you could just maybe dis discuss or, or, or kind of see what comes to mind as far as how you would suggest navigating performance and longevity in as much as it is, you know, relevant to, to managing insulin. I keep my fasting insulin uh, levels between five and eight. If, and I try not to let them get lower. If I find that they're lower, than that, I start asking, is there beta cell fatigue? Mm. And I look at adiponectin because adiponectin is inverse, you know, is has an inverse relationship with fasting insulin. You really want higher adiponectin. It's an anti-inflammatory cytokine. It, it does good things. A low adiponectin is inflammatory, right? It increases insulin resistance. It increases inflammation. It increases cardiovascular disease. So if somebody said to me, look, Doreen, I need to do X for this short period of time. Okay. I'll let their insulin, I'll let their glucoses, you know, get up there for a bit, but I don't let them live there long term because of the ramifications of insulin resistance on cardiovascular health and, you know, just 
overall inflammation. It's probably, you know, high insulin levels are probably the most inflammatory thing that we in society deal with, given the number of overweight, insulin resistant and diabetic patients there are. Great. That's incredible insight. And I'll definitely look at that. I've got one client right now who's who's dealing with some just systemic inflammation. He's trying to push his calories up. So I think that that's probably a good market to look at is the uh, adiponectin. Yeah. Yeah. That and, you know, whatever he's trying to do, the question is, is it too much? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, time. You know, because you got to balance longevity with right now. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you like me would say if I knew what I if I knew if I knew then what I know now, I may have thought differently. Yeah, and it's funny because I talk to a lot of young bodybuilders who say, "Hey, man, you know, could could you advise me?" And I said, "Man, if, if you know if you knew what I know now, you wouldn't do what you do. You, you wouldn't be able to do what you do. Like, you know, as a bodybuilder, for me, if I had the you know a, a fraction of the the understanding of the damage I was doing." I, there's no way I would have continued to do it. I, I think you'd have to be, well, I don't want to make any comments, but you'd have to, you, you would have to certainly question your, your sanity to say, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. No, you know, so I think at some level, ignorance is bliss. You know, that being said, I want to, I want to ask, you know, knowing some, a bit, some idea of what I did, what would you be doing to reverse it? Would it be just like tons of fasting? Cause I'll be honest, my, my blood panels are great. You know, my blood panels, if you look at it from the outside, like they're pretty good. Like I'm sure there's some under, underlying stuff that's a little bit broken. But, you know, if you're just looking at the bloods, like these are pretty good. You know, my, my glucose is great. I don't exactly know where my adiponectin is. But in general, most doctors go, yeah, this is very, very good. But I, I know there's damage done. And I'm curious, you know, just specific to insulin, if you were to say, hey, there's, there's you know, 50,000 bodybuilders listening to this who have been pushing insulin pathways for 10, 20, 30 years. And maybe they're starting to see some some insulin resistance. Maybe their blood glucose is creeping up. Maybe their A one C is creeping up, and they know they're they're like, "Hey, man, I'm I'm teetering on the brink of bad stuff here." Is it just like you you got to bring the protein and the carbs back, keep the protein high, and then just pull the carbs back, or or any other interventions hormonally? Or sorry, that's a, that's a loaded question, but curious if you have any insights. Well, first of all, I would pull back on their carbs, depending on what they're trying to do, and their protein. A bit because you know they both turn into glucose. And then I would ask them what their 10 or 15 year goals are. And be around. Yeah, well, that's what everybody says. And then yeah. I'd look at their hormones. I would look at their testosterone. I would look at their cortisol, right? Because cortisol also drives insulin. If the brain thinks it's got to run away from a white tiger, you're going to mobilize all that glucose, insulin is going to go up. And over time, people become insulin resistant. So I would look at those specific things. I'd look at an advanced lipid profile and scare people half to death when they saw that their particle numbers were elevated, their vasculature was inflamed. And you know, sometimes people need to have a significant emotional event. Yeah. So totally. those are the things that that I would do. And I would try and bring their fasting insulin uh, down. I call it the proverbial punch in the face, right? And say, bring back the punch in the face because our, our reality is our, our society is soft. Like we're like, everything's got to be uh, euphemisms. And I'm like, no, nah, you just kind of need to punch in the face. Otherwise, you're not going to change. That's that's very, very helpful. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot there. You brought up You brought up the the detailed fat lipid lipid panel. And I'm curious, we got to go down the path of cholesterol. And it seems as though, and I'm sure you'll you'll bring some light to the conversation, but it seems as though finally, in the last maybe two years, it seems like there's people coming out and actually explaining cortisol or sorry, cholesterol in a way that makes sense. You're like, oh, because for so long it was like cortisol is bad. No, or sorry, keep saying cortisol. Cholesterol is bad. No, cholesterol is good. You get, you need it. You don't need it. It should be this. It should be that. And now finally we're like, okay, we're, it seems like we're starting to finally clear away the mud and, and get a little bit of clarity around cholesterol. And I would love it if you could, you know, give us a, a, some insight into cholesterol's implications specifically around cardiovascular function. Yeah. I know this is an area that you're, you're very well first in. Well, good cholesterol is good. You need cholesterol. It makes hormones, you know, so you need cholesterol. Your body makes most of the cholesterol in the liver that you need. And so it's when cholesterol becomes oxidized or becomes damaged 
and small that it is an inflammatory cholesterol, which I say an inflammatory product that can get into the vascular wall and cause plaque. And as you know, I'd say 50% of heart attacks or more occur on only mild blockages Mm. because of inflammation. Now, when you take in cholesterol, when you take in fat, as long as you're taking in good fat, your body needs fat to make lipid layers in cells. It's when you take in a lot of bad fat that it becomes oxidized again, the LDL molecule becomes small and dense, and it damages the endothelial wall. There are two parts. There's the glycocalyx, which is this blanket over the endothelial cell. And elevated glucose can damage the glycocalyx. Insulin resistance damages the glycocalyx. Hypertension damages the glycocalyx. And once that starts, you can repair it. But if you continue the cycle, that's what's going to lead to inflammatory vascular disease. And so you need to eat good fats, good carbs, and good protein. You don't want to eat a marble, even though we all may love a big fat ribeye or porterhouse that's marble. Well, that's not really the best thing in the world for you. Now, a lean flat iron or a, you know, a rib steak or, you know, a New York strip, that's fine. You need carnitine. You need stuff that you get from red meat. Yeah. You know, it's really balanced in, in the diet. It's not all or nothing. So is it the saturated fat itself in the fatty steak that's the problem? Because you have these camps that say there's no challenge with saturated fat whatsoever until you add carbohydrate. When you mix the two, it's the kiss of death. And so I'm curious your thoughts on, um, yeah, like what is it about red meat, the fatty red steak, that is the challenge? It's the saturated fat. You know, it's saturated fat, period. You're going to eat some saturated fat. Yeah. But again, as you read, when you mix it with carbs, it's even worse. But your diet should not be high in saturated fats. That okay. is not good for anybody. We're not talking about olive oil. We're not talking about, you know, almonds or nuts or seeds. You know, we're talking about, you know, potato chips. We're talking about beef jerkies that you buy over the counter that are not natural. We're talking about marble steaks. I think eggs are fine. So if we're going to talk about things like eggs, unless you have the genetics of an APOE 4-4 or a 3-4, 2-4 is very rare. It's the 4 then you really have to worry about saturated fat unless your entire diet is built on saturated fat. If you're a 3-3 or a 2-2, saturated fat's not going to hurt you unless you pair it with icky carbs and then you create a monster. Standard American diet, bacon and pancakes. Yes. Yeah. Bad news. Very, very bad news. So people should get their genetics. You know, even though genetics are expensive, APOE testing gives you a lot of insight into your diet. So if somebody has a four in their APOE, I keep them on about less than 30 grams of saturated fat a day. Familial hypercholesterolemia. You know, it's even worse. You know, it's even lower than that. So someone primary sources of fat then. So obviously I, I'm going to I'm going to make an assumption here, but I'm going to assume we're on the same camp of, you know, most people are saying you got to avoid vegetable oils because those are tend to be pro-inflammatory. So if we are consuming a relatively high fat diet, is it primarily just fruit oils? Is it going to be like coconut, avocado, and and olive oil? And that's and maybe some some eggs? Grapeseed oil and eggs, but nobody can live on a ketogenic diet forever. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not doing a ketogenic diet, then you're mixing carbs with that high fat, and some of it may be saturated because people don't really eat just monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. They eat, you know, the icky saturated fats and then those carbs creep in, right? And then protein creeps in. So that's why the ketogenic diet is very specific where it's high in fat, 70% or so, and protein and carbs are really low. So you don't get that. What are your primary sources of protein, Doreen? Because, you know, if you're not eating a lot of beef, you hear people saying, well, chicken and turkey are terrible because they're eating you know, usually soy and corn. And then obviously fish has problems because, you know, of of metals. So like, where are we, where are we getting our protein? Where where are you suggesting we get, you know, let's say 80% of our protein? 
I'll give you the cardiology answer, plant-based. Right. Just okay. like the, the Mediterranean diet. If yep. you ask Doreen what she does, I grew up in the same world, Ben, that you grew up in. Yep. I love steak, right? I don't eat it every day. I eat chicken and it's really, you know, chickens that are running around on a farm, the same thing with eggs. So, you know, I, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and there is a wonderful place here that the chickens and the everything run around. They're just eating off the grass, no toxins, no nothing. I get my eggs and my chicken. Do I eat a lot of fish? Well, it's hard to get really good fish in Asheville, North Carolina. But when I lived in the Northwest, I ate freshwater fish and I ate salmon and I ate those things in moderation because of the mercury and all the other stuff. So really, you can't, and I eat grass-fed organic meat. So, you know, I do the best I can. Now, can I get enough protein? Can you get enough protein as lifters eating chickpeas? No. Eating beans? No. Are they not pro-inflammatory, Doreen? So, you know, pea protein. can be. Yeah, yeah. So I'm very, that that's like, I'm trying to avoid inflammation. That's usually the lens through which I pass everything. And then I'm like, okay, well, beans and, and pea protein, are these not driving up inflammation? They can. Depends on the person. So, you know, there's there's two sides of every coin. Oh, never eat red meat. Well, that's not realistic. Mm -hmm. Always eat legumes. Well, first of all, that's not realistic. And they can be inflammatory, you know, in people. So, you know, there's a balance. And I always try and encourage people to eat real food. And I know that the bodybuilders listening say, I can't get all that real food into me. I need to do protein shakes. Do a clean protein shake, you know, if anything else. You say, well, you say it's not realistic, like not eating meat. Like I'm not a realistic person. I'll do whatever the hell I need to do to to optimize. But it seems like there's Forever. so much, maybe, I think so, to be, <laughs> to be honest. So what I would like to get to the bottom of is like eating for your genetics. I feel like this has to be the next frontier. And I think we're getting closer, but based on, you know, the SNPs and, and what you're expressing and obviously your history there's got to be some one, hopefully in this world, there may be a group of people working on, you know, you enter a little bit about your health data, you enter your current blood panel, you talk about your, or you enter your DNA and all of a sudden it goes, here's the foods that your body needs right now. And you run this every three months and you just, I could, I could, ex- based on your goals, of course, but I could exist on whatever the hell it tells me to. Cause I, as a bodybuilder, as you understand, or like I removed pleasure from food in general, right? It's usually like, I just kind of eat to either be satiated to to fuel my next workout or I don't know, because it's social. So there is a company called 4x4 Genetics that actually does that. Oh, well. And, you know, I have used it a bunch uh, with patients and they've changed their diet, but I haven't had anybody be able to maintain a purely, unless they totally wanted to give up meat. If they didn't want to do that, it's hard for people to really do that. So this company is advocating vegan diets? Oh, no. It, it basically looks at your genetics and looks at what you should and shouldn't eat. Now, I eat basically a 70% plant-based diet. Okay. It's the other 30% that's not purely plant-based. My plate is, half my plate is vegetables. There's a small amount of carbs and a small amount of protein. But my plate is basically vegetables. Yeah, I say the same. I say I'm 50% vegan and 50% carnivore. But it's it's probably more like what you're saying. It's it's like 75% of my plate is vegetables, a little bit of fat, and then uh, right. you know, a de- right. decent sized portion of protein. Because right. I put olive oil on it. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think where the lines get really blurred, and again, I think it's always going to be that way. It's just, I mean, that, that's why people look for coaching is, is like, it has to be nuanced. It has to be circumstantial. It has to be goal dependent and seasonally dependent and where the lines get blurred is between longevity and performance, right? And I think those two will always be at odds at some level. I, you know, although I'll say it's, if it's a listener, you know, I'm sure you'll agree is health is at the, the foundation of all performance. So you first optimize for health and then you start you know, stacking things on top for performance. That's really how I address everybody is like fix the base level health first, which is why these conversations around hormones are so great because most people come and, and as you know, they're just a mess. They're broken. And so is hormone intervention uh, the biggest lever we have? Hormone and lifestyle. Lifestyle, yeah. But it's people, people want a pill. You know, mm. I don't know how many people you deal with who say, just give me something to fix it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not that easy. Yeah. You know, you mentioned, it takes you mentioned, work. 
you mentioned earlier the GLP one agonist semaglutide. You mentioned I don't know if you mentioned that on our book, something or something I was listening to earlier in the day. But I'm, I'd be curious to your opinions on that. If you have any clients using it, and if you have any experience with that. Yes, I have experience with semaglutide. I have experience with tesafensine, uh, which is another one, and the new one that just got F- recently got FDA approved, and now it's going for weight loss terzepatide. I've experienced with all of them. And really, um, they work. They all work. There are some clients who do better than others on one versus another. But I typically start most people, if they have cardiovascular risk factors, on semaglutide because of the data with decreasing cardiovascular events. Hmm. I start patients very low. I probably start patients lower than the starting dose. I start people on, actually, I probably start people on 0.1, which is 0.25 milligrams for a month. The biggest side effects- Like once a week for a month? Yeah. Are the protracted nausea. People get nauseous three to five days after. And the way to kind of mitigate that is have them start eating a lighter diet beforehand because these drugs work by decreasing your cravings, decreasing your hunger, and then your belly is full. You take the drug and you're nauseous. All of them will give some degree of nausea. Tesafensine has the least, but you can't use Tesafensine is oral. Some glutide and terzepatide are uh, subcutaneous injections. Are they more or less the same as far as their, their effect or what, what would be the... the, the... Terzepatide has been shown at the one milligram semaglutide dose to cause more weight loss hmm. and better glucose control. So based on how overweight somebody is, will drive my decision making and their cardiovascular risk factors. Now, terzepatide is safe for the cardiovascular system, but there are no studies yet that say it decreases event rates. Got it. That's, and that's once you reason. get people through that nausea cycle, and I typically give people uh, Odansetron, which is Zofran, the ODT, the oral dissolvable tablets, you know, to take. Uh, most people do fine, especially if they start cutting back the amount of food they eat. So I've got a handful of clients taking the semaglutide. And one thing I've noticed during is a significant decrease in HRV and increase in resting heart rate. Have you seen that? Yes, because they're dehydrated. Uh. They're not eating a lot. And that's probably what's driving that. Are they losing weight? Are they changing their eating style and... Like less food in general? Here's what happens. All of the studies have documented that once they stop, if they haven't changed their lifestyle regarding eating, exercise, whatever, they're going to gain the weight back. So, And they won't lose as much if they continue their same eating habits while on the drug. I was just cautious because anytime I see someone who's overweight and their resting heart rate's going up by 20%, I was like, whoa, this could be bad news. Like maybe we should be careful with this. And their HRV goes, you know, cuts in half almost sometimes. I'm like, okay, this, this to me says we got to stop. Like, so what we started doing, you know, working with their doctors, of course, is cut, just like you said, cutting down the dose very, very small and it's almost mm-hmm. like micro dosing. And that seems to mitigate the effect. Yeah. I mean, I micro dose everybody. And yep. if somebody is losing weight on a particular dose, I don't necessarily increase it. Right. You know, if they're losing weight and it's doing what it's supposed to do, then I don't, I don't go up just because you can. I'm curious where you sit on, as a cardiologist, on the statin conversation. I've had a client recently come back and he's done his, his arterial plaque score, which is a zero. He's in his, oh, he's like, he's 50. Um, very low plaque score, but his the size of his arterial thickness is slightly elevated and his cholesterol is a little bit elevated and, and his doctor suggesting statins. And, you know, we have Peter Atia now, I'm sure you're familiar with just kind of being like, hey, statins are great. And everybody else in the world says, man, statins are going to cause some negative side effects. And I have no idea. Like, I'm certainly not a cardiologist or someone who's an expert on, on you know, cardiovascular drugs. So I'm curious where you sit on that conversation. In people who have, let's start with the easy category. Secondary prevention, people who have had an event, the data is clear. Statins decrease event rates, statins decrease mortality, statins 
is statin, statin, statin. It's an immune modulator. It decreases inflammation. Do you have to keep them on the statin forever? That depends on how inflamed they stay, how they change their lifestyle. Primary prevention is a little harder. The patient you described has subclinical vascular disease. Their CIMT is a little thick. Their coronary calcium score is zero, you said? Yeah. Is zero. Okay. And their, I don't know what their advanced lipid panel shows, what their LDL particle number is, or any of those other things. But in that guy, if he doesn't want to take statins, if he changes his lifestyle, changes his diet, and I would do something like niacin or Reggie's rice. Things didn't change because if he changes his diet and eats more of a Mediterranean style diet, you know, you'll decrease event rates by 20%. So before I would put that guy, if he's adamant about not taking a statin and I tell him all the good stuff statins do. He's not, he's not adamant. He's, he's looking for, he's looking for guidance. I, in somebody like him, because he's got subclinical vascular disease, I'd put him on a statin. Now, do statin, can statins potentially cause insulin resistance? Yeah, you just monitor people's blood sugar. Do statins cause cognitive impairment? That data is kind of like not that great out there. You know, it's a matter of balancing the evils of cardiovascular disease, which in, in somebody like that guy, if he's got minimal plaque that, you know, his calcium score is zero, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have soft plaque or minimal plaque. It just means it's not calcified. He can drop dead of a heart attack. And we know he has a thickened uh, CIMT. So that guy gets a statin for me. Does that come from the, the, the increased size of CIMT? Does that come from heavyweight training? Can that influence it? It only if he's inflamed. It's all driven by inflammation, right? Vascular disease is a chronic inflammatory disease. So it's going to be driven by inflammation, insulin resistance, damaging the glycocalyx um, and the endothelium. So would we, would we look at like an aggressive three to six month protocol to drop inflammation systemically, like doing everything we can and then re reassess or would you go straight to assess? I'd put them on our tyrosol. It has been uh, approved for plaque regression. So I put them on Arturiso, one or two BID, do aggressive lifestyle stuff. You won't see plaque regression probably in three months, but you can in six months. I'm not familiar with Arturiso. I'm just looking it up. I'll find it's it. made by Calroy. Oh, glycocalyx regenerating product. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. Can you because you seen... have to violate the glycocalyx in order to get endothelial dysfunction, in order to get a thickened uh, CIMT or coronary plaque. Any negative effects to uh, no. Arturiso? No, I haven't found any. And I've been using it for a while. I use it on everybody. I use it on people with leaky guts. I, you know, It's not indicated for that, but look, they have an endothelium also. I should say it's not approved for that. Is this um, over-the-counter or is this a uh, prescription? No, it's over-the-counter. Oh wow, that's wonderful. Good to know. That that that's a that's a big one right there. That's great. And and so I was actually that was perfect segue into if you've seen any other interventions actually reversing arterial plaque. I want to be respectful of your time. I know, so I apologize for going long. But no, you're fine. Uh, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. If you've seen any any other interventions, that's the big one. And statins. I mean, the statin data is you know is out there. Yeah. Have you looked at any enzymes like serapeptase or natokinase? I've seen I've seen some people talking about the potential or even, um, I don't know if you know, there's a guy out there who's kind of preaching high dose vitamin K and saying he's reversed all his arterial plaques. I'm curious if you've ever come across any research on that or seen any... any um... yeah, vitamin K drives calcium towards the bone and away from the, uh, from the carotids. I don't know what high dose is. I don't know how long they have to be on it and how big the studies were, but depending on the patient and their overall risk, I stick to two things, which is statins and arterosil. In somebody who has just a little bit, you know, like if say you want CIMT, you want the intermedial thickness to be less than 0.5, say somebody's is 0.7. I wouldn't necessarily put them on a statin. If they didn't want to take a statin, I'd start with a Mediterranean diet, arteriso, you know, all the lifestyle things to decrease inflammation. So I'm just, I just pulled up the vitamin K that 
the specific one that, I, that I've heard works is 30.5 milligrams is just taking it twice a day. It's also got some astaxanthin in there. Um, this is one specific guy, I'm not going to say his name, but he's, uh, he's not a cardiologist, but he, he's now, I think he's a physicist or something. And he, he talks about how he's reversed his arterial plaque and, you know, hundreds of other people who are kind of in his little sub community. He's kind of like one of these, you know, there's these like little health gurus who live in a little corner of the internet, but I've come across some of his stuff and he seems, seems relatively credible. So I'm curious if you've seen anybody, anybody try that? No, I haven't. Okay. I'll look okay. into him. Yeah, I'll send you his name when we stop. I don't, I don't like to okay. throw anybody under the bus. Or I, actually, you know no, what? I'm no. gonna throw. Yeah, I'll say. So his name is is Patrick Toit, and it's, it's, it, that's how he pronounces his last name. It's T H E U T. And so if you look him up on YouTube, he's got some really good. He's got some really good lectures, or he walks through his entire protocol, and you know, he's big on 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 the technical cardiovascular um, things like you know CoQ10 and Pycnogenol and PQQ and all these typical things that people are are taking for uh, optimization of cardiovascular health. And I guess that's a good question. Are you an advocate of all of those as well? Do they have utility or is yes. it too tough? Yeah. Yes. Yes. They absolutely do. Amazing. Doreen, this is so much information. I feel like I just want to keep you know, peppering you with questions, but I'm going to be respectful of your time. Gosh, it's so great to know that someone's out there who loves to train, who's got this level of depth of insight in cardiology and hormones and I would love to have you back on. I'd love to figure out ways to to learn from you more. And if you're teaching, if you're doing courses, if you could share that with us, so our audience can also learn from you. And uh, I, I really appreciate you making the time and, and for what you continue to do. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And I'd love to come back. Let everybody know I do a monthly series for Wells Pharmacy. They can just sign up and register. This month, I'm talking about breast cancer and hormones. But starting in January, we're going to do this entire series on weight loss peptides and then immune and inflammation peptides. And, you know, just we're going to keep going through all of the um, all of the peptides, peptides that help with sleep, anxiety, things like that. That's awesome. I love that you're going down the peptide path because as, as I mentioned, I am as well. And certainly not to the level you are, but I, I usually read about an hour a day and it's either some combination of, uh, probably sometimes more than an hour a day, I should say, but some combination of peptides, hormones, and cardiovascular optimization. So it's like you and I are, are literally <laughs> speaking the same language. So I'm going to follow your path. And I will follow yours. Oh, thanks, Doreen. I appreciate you very much. Uh, I'll link to everything that you send us in the show notes. So anyone who listen to the podcast, go to muscleintelligence.com slash podcast. Doreen's podcast will be there and we'll send you to anything that you think is relevant to us. And I really, really am grateful for you being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'll send you the blog that I wrote on testosterone in males debunking the myths for your readers. Amazing. Thanks, Doreen. It's my pleasure. And that's a wrap. Thanks for being here, ladies and gents. A little bit of summary for you. Some key takeaways from Dr. Saltiel. Everyone's different. And that's the big takeaway that I try to convey to you when it comes to training or when it comes to supplements or when it comes to nutrition. There's no cookie cutter answer. And if you're somebody who's taking cookie, cut, cookie cutter information off the internet, ultimately, you're probably failing yourself. You're probably not giving yourself all the tools you need to succeed. And I know if you're listening to this podcast, you care about your life, you care about your health. And guys, I'm, I'm telling you, if you're going to prioritize anything, prioritize your cardiovascular health, which means, yes, we want to train with weights, but yes, we also need to do cardio. Yes, we also need to learn to calm our nervous system, right? We can't be in a state of gas pedal all the time. We need to learn to take our foot off the gas and ultimately apply the brake once in a while, right? Let's get out of your own way. Let's learn to calm the nervous system. All those things that you don't want to do, probably the things you should be doing, the meditation, the yoga, the cardiovascular conditioning, all things that guys typically like, ah, I don't want to do that. These are the things that you need. So the, the cardiovascular health isn't going to take you out, right? Ultimately, if we want to live a long life, which, and guys, I talk about this too. Some guys are like, I don't care to live a long life. Yes, you do. And you must. You know why? Because all this wisdom you're acquiring in your life must be passed on to our future generations because there's people out there who are trying to manipulate your offspring. They're trying to take away the freedom and ultimately the ability to think and act of your children. This is why we need you around to not only teach your children, but to teach your grandchildren. I think one of the things that's lost in our society is the passing down of brilliance and information and tradition. And kids kind of feel lost in this world because they're like, I don't really know who, how I fit in or where I fit in and what am I supposed to do? And I don't know what my traditions are. I don't really have any of those. So now you still go start looking for some other tribe to fit into, some other uh, people, some other community of people that will accept me. And that's where things start to go south. So first, make your bed, right? Make your bed at home. Like Make sure the things you're taking care of in your house, this is with your partner, this is with your children. 
love and accept those children. You're, I'm telling you, you can't take the money with you. Like while money is wonderful and important and we want great, we want great and amazing things, get your values straight, right? Do you need more money or do you need time with your children? Do you need time with your partner? Right? Think about that. How are you balancing your time? Know your values, know how to make, how you make decisions and ultimately know that you do not want to be the guy who is on his deathbed and has a big bank account and an empty heart with nobody in your, in your uh, hotel room or your hospital room. So, gents, um, thank you very much for being here. Dr. Doreen Saltiel, as I said, is an incredible wealth of information. A little bit of summary. Testosterone is neither good or bad. Dosing ultimately seems to make it so. And, and the state that it goes into is incredibly important, meaning you could take testosterone, I could take testosterone. It's going to do very different things based on our state of stress, our state of other hormones, uh, our body fat levels. So if you have high body fat, your body's going to convert a lot of testosterone to estrogen, which is not a good idea. Peptides are a really good idea for some people. And I wouldn't suggest just haphazardly doing these things. I would suggest that you strongly um, find some very, very um, well-educated, experienced practitioners to work with. Uh, when it comes to cardiovascular health, there's a few basic things that you can do consistently that are ultimately going to know you're doing well. One starts with nutrition, sleep, stress management, blood pressure. If your blood pressure is elevated, guys, you got to fix it. So if you guys are already working with someone, uh, one, I'll do the best I can to help you for free on this podcast. So this is why we have these guests. Um, but there's some, some really basic things you can be doing every day. You know, if your blood pressure is elevated, chill out on the sodium a little bit and learn to meditate, right? Spend some more time in nature. That'll kill, chill your blood pressure right there. Some of the things I've been doing recently to bring down my arterial plaque and ultimately bring down my blood pressure, which I guess I said, I've never had an issue with blood pressure, um, but I also want to make sure it's not hot. I've been taking something called natokinase, which is a digestive enzyme that helps to break down specific proteins in the blood that are shown to increase clotting. If you're someone who's predisposed to clotting, again, I'm not giving you medical advice, but go ahead and ask your practitioner or your doctor, if you may be someone who's a candidate for natokinase, I also use serapeptase and lumbrokinase, all these different enzymes that are apparent, that have a lot of research behind them on how to or, or on their ability to ultimately reverse arterial plaques and these fibrin tissues that ultimately can contribute to things like clotting or um, arthrosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. So uh, definitely check that out. Again, not medical advice. Go ahead and check it out. I suggest you do some research. Look at, look into it for yourself. And definitely talk with your cardiologist or other medical practitioner. If you're someone who thinks you may have some challenges going on in the ticker. Ladies and gents, uh, again, final shout out to our great sponsors for the show, Organifi.com slash muscle. If you're not already taking reds and you're a man over the age of 40, start. Take it every day. I take it every day. Usually post-training, I'll take one scoop of greens, one scoop of reds. I add a bunch of other stuff in there. I'll add some creatine in there. I'll add some mushrooms in there. I'll add some adaptogenic herbs in there like ashwagandha, even though reds already has a little bit of ashwagandha, I add a little bit more. Um, yeah, and maybe even some, um, some additional adaptions like rhodiola or schisandra berries, uh, things like that just make me feel so good every day. I don't need to consume huge amounts of coffee. I do drink coffee, usually one a day, but I don't need it. And so uh, I'm making sure I'm taking care of my health. So I show up with the energy to thrive and lead myself first, lead my community, lead my family and uh, show up with energy for this kind of stuff. Have a great day, guys. Appreciate you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.